want to do my little intro. Uh, for for those of you who don't know, the pre-show were all um, clips from Dennis's work. Uh, we did a little bit of the trailer from American Autumn to Occidoc, uh some of Manifest Destiny's Child, which was another feature-length movie he did. Um, and we also did some clips from his acronym TV channel. And before we wind up tonight, Dennis, I want to make sure you promo the new the new channel so everybody knows. And I did throw that clip in the loop. But but um, Dennis is an activist, writer, director, um, best known, I think, uh, in, at least in our arena, for American Autumn to Aki Doc, which we all know and love. Um, surprisingly enough, or maybe not so surprisingly, once I started researching Dennis's background and career, you know, the reason he has game is because he has game. And for those of you who didn't know this, I'll throw this little tidbit out. He was a writer and a media consultant for Dennis Kucinich's 2008 presidential campaign. So once again, I'm in deep water and I will try to do the best I can. So welcome. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Mark. Well, uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so why don't we jump right in? If you could give us an overview of your background, um, you know, your education, your experiences, and what led you to be a media producer, and maybe a couple of highlights from your career that were formative. Sure. Um, you know, my my background and my training is actually in the world of theater. I um, I, I, I was uh, I kind of a, a fuck up in high school and college and uh, fell into the theater there uh, to chase girls and I got a, I got some good response and before I knew it I woke up I was running a small theater company in New York City I had gone to graduate school I was doing some acting off off Broadway some experimental stuff and then I had uh, a daughter and I took what was you know a very kind of um, uh, safe kind of regular choice and I took a job teaching and I, I was teaching high school theater uh, both in inner city schools uh, and then um, in some of the, in a, a, some elite prep schools that had endowments of seven hundred, eight hundred million dollars. So I've run the gamut of the type of uh, kid that I've worked with in high schools. And I guess what got me into producing new media was really a, an accident, Mark. I uh, I guess about four or five years ago in 2007, I decided to leave teaching because I had a play that had um, been in New York. I had done some political activism when I was younger. I'd fallen in and out, but this play had gotten a little bit of attention, and someone said, you know, uh, we want to pair you with this dude from ABC. We want to help you write a, a TV pilot. So I saw dollar signs in my eyes, and I, I thought I was going to get rich, and I started to write this TV pilot. But you can only do that for a couple hours a day, and that's right around the time that YouTube was starting. So I would spend my mornings uh, doing this um, character called Davis Fleetwood. He was a hermit who lived in a basement and would do these political rants on YouTube. Uh, and YouTube's political arena was just kicking off then. And for me, this is just kind of a creative outlet, you know, just another version of myself. I say it was a character, but really just an, another version of myself. And yeah, that, after only about two months of doing this, Mark, uh, Dennis Kucinich's campaign offered me a job to be an embedded YouTube video blogger. So I guess I'm the first video blogger to be employed by a presidential campaign, but I'm also the first work of fiction, I'm pretty sure, to be uh, uh, employed by a presidential campaign. I traveled around the country during the short time with Kucinich, uh, that his camp with the short time that his campaign was uh, going on strong through the end of January. Uh, and then and then it started to become possible for making video content to be at least piece piece some kind of a living together between don people who give donations on the website uh, and generating ad revenue from the videos and things like that. Um, and then you know I I, I became I started doing video and I, I started uh, my my entree into the Occupy movement was actually through a group called the October 2011 Coalition. I was doing video and organizing for them. Uh, this was a group that had called for the indefinite occupation of public space in Freedom Plaza, Washington, D.C. This call came out way before the Adbusters call, and I was working with a lot of seasoned activists, and I committed to going to uh, leaving my wife and family and going for a month down to uh, Freedom Plaza in Washington, D.C., because I thought this was the beginning of a revolution. Uh, it wasn't the beginning, actually. We were late. Uh, Occupy Wall Street came along, and thank goodness, and we became, the, uh, the thing at Freedom Plaza became one chapter in a much larger uh, national and global movement, which is very exciting. And 
um, you know, I got to make a, a documentary about that, which you mentioned, and thank you very much, and I'm proud of that work. And uh, now I'm back into daily video production. Uh, I just teamed up with the Young Turks uh, Network, so I'm part of the Young Turks Distribution Network now, uh, which just means um, I say whatever Jenk you no, I'm only kidding. Uh, it just <laughs> it just means that uh, I get to share in the distribution leverage of the largest online news media channel uh, in in the world. So uh, I'm looking forward to that, and I've been able to carve out an independent doing things that I want to do, saying things that I want to say making enough money to pay my bills and usually and I'm a home in time to play with my kids when they get home from school. So all's good. Yeah, so you're you're living a dream that a lot of us aspire to. So and I want to tell the folks, I mean they've heard me me talk about you frequently, but one of the highlights of my year last year was being able to meet you and to hang out with you a little bit at DNC and I just I just learned so much from the limited time we got to spend together about um, you, you, your art and craft and how you conduct yourself. Um, to see you as part of some of the meetings that we were doing up at Area 15 and just how you worked in the field, it was just very inspiring. So I, I learned a lot and I'm just still digesting all that. So I appreciate you know my fortunate exposure to, to meet you and you were very supportive and generous of what we were trying to do down there. So. Um, I just wanted to get that out in the open in front of everybody. <laughs> um, so you touched on fictional characters in politics, and I have to guess that there's probably a lot more of them than Davis Fleetwood, <laughs> because <laughs> all evidence, you know. But um, you you did mention you're politically active, and maybe you could explain to the people how that informs your work, your daily work that you do for people who aren't familiar with it yet. Yeah, I guess, you know, like a lot of people in the Occupy movement, uh, I, I this sounds funny for someone who worked for a Democratic candidate for president, but I, I guess, you know, four or five years ago, I might have thought um, that if we get the right group of Democrats into office, that we could really make some positive change. I no longer think that. I would not work for a Democrat now. I would not work for a Kucinich now. Um, I like, I respect the man, but I, I just don't see any way out, any way. I mean, the, the system that, that we that we live in now, the pendulum swinging back and forth between left and right, and that pendulum swing is remarkably tiny, right? So this is how my political views inform my work. Uh, I'm way outside of that. So I'm never going to get a job in the mainstream media. I don't want a job in the mainstream media. I think part of our job as independent media is to cut down one of the pillars that's holding up this empire, the American empire, which is, I, th I think, quite literally a homicidal force. Mm -hmm. That we cut down this pillar, not by necessarily attacking it, but by create, you know, creating our own media. Create, and that's the one of the great uh, democratic forces of the internet, right? That people can tell their own stories, tell the stories that they think that they need to, that need to be told in a way that. that that they feel needs that they need to tell them to get the stories out to the people who need to hear them. You know, and it's very difficult. It's like you know a salmon swimming upstream trying to get your voice heard in between the the, the kind of deafening sound of that's going back and forth between MSNBC and Fox. Mm -hmm. So the way I guess my politics informs my work is that I I have taken it. A, I see I see myself as one person among many. Uh, whose job it is to create a new uh, media to def help defeat this empire. I'm, I'm participating in a nonviolent revolution. Best like um, that was. I mean, that was a pretty, pretty great and succinct um, summary of that. And you know, it's the the whole making our own media thing is so important. And um, I, in researching this show, I kept referring back to some of the stuff Amy Goodman talks about, about how the media can be like the big dinner table that we all gather around and exchange ideas and information and have debate and argument and bring things out into light. And how so often, most often, MSN is, is not that. And that it's mm -hmm. incumbent on all of us to try to do that. So I appreciate that sentiment. Um, do you want to expand a little bit on the role of new media in the arena of the social justice movement? Um, you know, uses, uh, 
benefits and drawbacks? Mm. Well, you mentioned uh, I, I'm not, I sh you said you mentioned that Global Rev might be carrying our conversation tonight. Right, right. You know, I, I remember being you know out in the field in the early days of the Occupy movement, out out on the road for weeks at a time, uh, uh, filming myself. But then, you know, as a husband and a father having to come home, uh, if I wanted to know what was going on at any different any different location, if I wanted to know what was going on in Tahrir Square, what got me inspired to get involved with the Occupy movement to make the documentary in the first place, I you know is is from uh, people like Vlad and uh, GlobalRevolution.com. Uh, so, you know, from that point of view, it had a very direct impact on me to get to basically turn over my life to this issue and to this cause and to creating media around it. Uh, and I'd like to think that I, in turn, have also influenced others to get involved as well. So, I mean, you know, it has a, it has a very direct impact. There's stories that, uh, that, that are moving that need to be told that don't get told on the mainstream media. Uh, so for me, that's one of the that's one of the empowering things. If something's going on, uh, it can be told. I'm not a I'm not a live streamer. I I actually do prefer to work with scripted content or editing video content to post at a later time. But I found that the live streamers have been incredibly incredibly useful in uh, protecting uh, protesters out in the field. I think police know that if they uh, hit somebody upside the head, that not only is a picture going to come down to them in the, in the court case, but it's going to go viral on the Internet right this second, right now. Uh, the limitations, of course, are in distribution channels. Most people, the large, the overwhelming majority of people in this country who may agree with us, we got to sit down and have a cup of coffee with them, are really not bad people. They're just busy. They're busy living their lives, paying their bills, getting their kids off to school and getting home and, and or whatever they're doing. If they're lucky to have, or, or maybe they're busy trying to pay their bills or trying to get their kids uh, a, a better situation. And they don't have the luxury that I have to kind of immerse myself in uh, all these different issues and digest them and spit them out and have, a, have an opinion on them. So that what they do to do is they get an hour of Rachel Maddow or an hour of Bill O'Reilly every night, and both of them are poison. Mm -hmm. uh, good point. Both of them are poison. You know, they're, they're equal doses from opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, there's a, a question popped up here, and some people are wondering if you can go into a little bit more detail about how you're able to support your your channels and where your funding comes from. And if you're not comfortable answering that, that's fine. I'm totally comfortable funding that. Before I started doing the documentary, um, I had I was I had produced a lot of content, uh, and and some of that content goes viral, meaning I'll get a couple hundred thousand. Or, or, or a mil sometimes over a million views. This I'm now I'm going back two years when I exclusively produce content that had is getting ad revenue. So, you know, at that point I was making about seventy or eighty percent of my money from ad revenue on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Doing the documentary on Occupy Wall Street, and I was producing daily video content around that. I felt less and less comfortable about embedding ads on, on the on the channel. Mm -hmm. uh, did fundraise. I had a Kickstarter project that uh, got me about thirty-five thousand dollars to upgrade equipment, to uh, hire two camera people that I would go on the road for uh, for the early part of the Occupy movement. And then there was one angel investor who pretty much carried the work, my work, kind of like an under. I felt like a poet in Elizabethan days. I had a patron, you know, to be honest, with you, yeah. who funded the work that I was doing. Um, post-production and without that person you, you know I would have had to have taken a regular job and you know I would have been just I would have been another person who started a documentary who, ne who never got to finish it yeah. uh, so now you know that money so we've licensed the documentary to a couple of cable stations like uh, RT and it's been on Link TV uh, it's been in a couple of film festivals so it's generated some revenue but that revenue has not even come close to the amount of money that we spent on the movie. So again, you know, I think, and this is, this mirrors my life as a theater director before I had children, you know, and in the nonprofit world, you rely on, you know, the kindness of strangers. Right now I am back into more of a mold where I am expecting uh, that within the next six months, I'm going to build up enough, a base of content that is ad based um, that 
uh, will support me. Uh, and at the same time, we're going to start to we're going to try to build up a uh, a low fee, like three dollars a month, for people who want to subscribe to Acronym TV, in the hopes that you know by the end of 2013 we can drop the the ads out of the out of these videos and be totally viewer supported and sustained. But for right now, uh, and I did sweat about this for months and months and months. Um, we're su we're supported with with ad revenue and uh, with underwriters. Okay, um, so two things there. I I hope the patron is watching because there are tens of thousands of people that are grateful for the support you gave Dennis and to enable him to do the work and inspire all of us. That also do try to do similar work, but also all the viewers and the the AccuDoc itself brought the message of Occupy to a much broader spectrum than could have been done without it. So so thank you, patron. Uh, the other point I want to make of that last little bit is one of the things that's always struck me about you is is your professionalism and the way you're you're trying to develop a sustainable model, which is everybody's challenge. Um, and I, I kind of smiled when you touched on your experience being with the theater because, you know, prior to doing this stuff myself, I was a working artist who couldn't sell anything to save my life. So I was used to being broken, doing my art for nothing. It's not what I like, but I understand the sentiment. And it actually kind of gives gives me an advantage over somebody that thinks, you know, like how to build that model. So thank you for the example you're setting for all of us. Uh, we appreciate that. Should producers, because this comes up all the time, should producers strive for objectivity in their work? I don't. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about that a little bit, because I know you don't, and I want to I want to have a little bit of conversation around that. Well, you know, I. I uh, Maybe I can quote Kurt Cobain to answer this. There's one song where, where a lyric goes something like, uh, uh, hate your enemies, save your friends, find a place, speak your truth, right? So everyone is going to have a different answer to that question. I, you know, I, I have sometimes too much confidence. I think that the way I see the world is correct. And I think that, if you know, for the most part, if people don't see the world the way I see the world, they're wrong. They're fucking wrong. And they need some. They need to be educated, not because I, you know, I want them to come around, but because I, you know, people think I'm, I'm using hyperbole. People fucking are dying, right? Because mm -hmm. of the way that capitalism has completely taken over our lives. You know, I'm working my way through David Graeber's book, uh, The History of Debt, and I, I recommend it. It's not. It's not a. It's not a beach read. It's but it's a transformative read in the way we think about money and the way we think about debt and the way we think about coinage and the way we think about how the money relates to each other so for me I, i'm not objective but that doesn't mean everyone's got to i think that work will resonate with people when you're doing work that's re, that's ringing a chord within yourself and it's true to yourself first so you know you sh you, people if people out there are looking to to copy somebody they should copy the person that they the best version of themselves they have going on in their mind and try to be that Yep. And I really appreciate that answer because I've thought a lot about it. And, and I feel like we each have our platforms and we should use them and not be afraid. As your acronym TV, you got to stand for something. And, and I really respect that. And, you know, we, we try to do the same thing. And I, I think in Charlotte, we had a lot of late night conversations about objectivity, subjectivity, um, you know, some of the streamers wanted to remain neutral. Some wanted to, to have an agenda. And so I was taking in all this information. And I think over the year, I, I made this statement, I've become much more radicalized, for one thing, because I early on I was like, well, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Maybe some reform is the answer. But now I'm completely scrap it all, just nonviolent revolution. Let's start over and do it right so so that's very specific you know uh, a subjective viewpoint and but i feel comfortable in owning it and part of that again is because i've i've seen people like yourself lee camp people like that who say okay here it is this is my opinion do with it as you will 
But mm -hmm. I'm going to put it out there because it's the only way people's minds can change is exposing them and challenging them. So thanks for that. Um, how could we, all of us out here, use these various platforms more effectively? I mean, we got YouTube, we got live streaming, we got Twitter, we got Facebook, we got the yada, yada, yada. And in my mind, there's a lot of noise flying around, but how can we use it more effectively, do you think? That's a great question. You know, I am, ne I, I am not now and I have never been a marketing expert. I think I got lucky early on in the YouTube game when YouTube had a vested interest. This is with Davis Fleetwood. This is not even with that, my own name. When YouTube had a vested interest in finding people who were going to produce interesting content in this political niche, right? I mean, YouTube had the... The, the cute cats video market covered, but if they wanted to be taken seriously and they wanted this partnership with CNN, they needed some people who were going to do, do some YouTube videos. So quite honestly, I got a lot of help from YouTube in the early days and then promoting my videos. One of the reasons that Kucinich hired me is that my videos were consistently getting more views than his videos. YouTube has changed a lot since then, and I can't keep up with the changes. You know, like I've been talking to some marketing people with the Young Turks who uh, as of uh, 2000, as of a couple of days ago, I've partnered with, and you know they're they're all up on these changes. But it, it, the long and the short of it is, it's much more difficult to find your way, um, find to find to find a platform to be to to jump out and not just be another needle in a haystack. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the answer to your question, I guess the answer to your question is to find someone who knows what the hell's going on marketing wise and take their and take their best advice. Right now, um, my strategy is I'm just putting my head down and I'm trying to partner with some people who know what they're doing as far as marketing and placement and things like that and, and hope that that works out. Um, you can check back in with me in a couple of months and I'll let you know if it's worked out. But uh, it worked out for the movie and it, it's worked out in, in other times. So uh, I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses and, and marketing is a, is a weakness. Yep. The um, you know this kind of leads into the next question about distribution and accessibility and and how to get beyond the internet bubble because live stream YouTube all that comes with a set of presumptions that people have internet access and equipment to do it and in our arena we just default to that um, but in my county that I live in 80% of the county does not have internet access so. Yeah, we have this great program on with these, these substantive ideas and compelling conversation, but they can't see it. So the challenge is how to get beyond those bubbles. What advice can you – that kind of comes back to the marketing and, and all that, correct? Well, yeah, I don't know if I want to boil that bigger question that you posed to me down to something as, as crass as marketing. But, uh, you know, it's, I, I think that's the word for it, right, is how to get, how, how to get the message to reach those people. Uh, Occupy taught us a great lesson, uh, and that is, you know, for all the cool things that we can do on the internet, you know, it, nothing really matters as much as the in person, uh, person to person, mutual aid, uh, working together, uh, away from our computers and in the streets with those individual people who. So then it doesn't matter who has internet, who doesn't have anything. Um, so there's other things that I, you know, you see people doing different things, you know, with the Occupy Wall Street Journal and different kind of uh, media's that are that are springing up, but. I guess, you know, everyone's got to define success for their own platform in their own individual way. I mean, I don't think that you should knock yourself for not being able to reach the 80% of your people in your area that don't have internet. You're doing an internet show. So, you know, if you're going to do something on the street corner, street busking or something like that, then, then maybe you can criticize yourself. But, I mean... You're you're opening yourself up to a much wider and bigger world than than uh, than than kind of local networking. Right, right. Well, that that offers some pretty good perspective to give me something to think about. I I actually try to do some of all of it, and I <laughs> so I get spread thin, and I have to refocus and say, wait, you know, I only have this many hours in a day, and uh, so to hear that is very helpful. Um, give us a little bit about. Um, discuss the value of narrative and storytelling because your your work is mostly scripted it's uh, rarely live so you are 
constructing a narrative to present. So let's talk about the reasons why and the value of that. Um, I, I guess it comes, well, I don't know, maybe the value question I can lead to later. The reasons why for me is that, you know, I do watch, like, you know, you sometimes you watch, like, the Young Turks, or you see, like, David Pacman or Sam Cedar, which basically, you know, the Young Turks has a nice studio, but basically the, the way that they're delivering text is the way a radio host would deliver text. It's it's conversational, things get repeated, it's over and over, and it's about getting as much content out into the world as possible. I guess I just prefer to craft, if I'm going to do a three-minute speak for three or four minutes on a, to on a topic, I prefer to sit down and craft what I'm going to say. Um, so, so that, you know, when I post that video, I know I didn't say something stupid that I didn't mean to say. I mean, I wrote it, I said it, you know, I'm, so I'm going to stand behind it. And I do think of myself, as you talk about platforms and, and, and medium, I do think of myself who is writing for video because I'm not that confident that people read mm -hmm. uh, anymore. So uh, that's one reason why I scripted. I, and I am drawn to story. I, I've written plays, and as an actor uh, and, and a theater director, I'm constantly looking for what's the story, not just what's the beginning, middle, and end, but what's the kind of question that people are asking when they're looking at this topic, and how can you... How can you answer or challenge uh, using that question? So for me, it's all it's all story. You know, when you when you're talking about crafting the documentary, when I came back with, I don't know, 300 hours of footage to sit down with, in, unless I didn't, unless I knew what the story was, I mean, I would have, I'd still be sifting through that footage, uh, you know. But I experienced the story that I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to tell very, very strongly, and so I was, I was looking for specific things as I was going through that editing process. So for me, it's, I mean, I think that's a, a cute observation. Um, the value, the value of that, is that I think we're wired that way. I mean, you know, it, we, we, we learned about Aristotle's Poetics when we were looking at, at, um, uh, at, at dramatic theory in, in graduate school, right? When I was taking acting school and. You know, it seems simple, but Aristotle was the first person to say the beginning is that part of the story before which nothing happens and after which the middle happens. The middle is that part of the story before which the beginning happens and after which the end happens. And the end is that part of the story before which the middle happens and after which nothing happens. You know, and that's deep and resonant because that we are born, we live, and we die. You know, each story is a little bit of a life. And I think there's a rhythm uh, uh, to each story that I try to find. And that the, and the, you don't always find that. The, su the successful kind of short-form video commentaries that I do, I think, fit into some kind of narrative. Um, I really, I mean, I love storytelling and narrative, and I think that's how we learn and how information is most effectively exchanged. So, so I really get a lot out of your three- and four-minute bits um, they're they're compressed, they're concise, they're insightful, and I find them really valuable. And I share them all over the place and get people who have never watched anything like that before go, "Wow, that was a really good point." Is there more? You know, and it's because of that that narrative um, and the the theater background. I think comes through that because you're you're making the points pretty quickly, um, which leads to my next question. You you are a prolific producer because you're sitting down you're doing bits every day sometimes two three four bits a day um, I know to some degree what that takes and I could never do one as good as you do could you just kind of just give an overview of your day when you're when you're working on acronym bits or, or something like that uh, we I spent November and December experimenting with different workflows so now, starting today, it was my first day back from vacation, and what I did today was I wrote uh, three. I did three stories. Um, we covered uh, we covered the Steubenville, uh, Ohio uh, mm -hmm. rape case. We covered uh, this funny story about a guy in California who got stopped in the uh, HOV lane. Uh, and was ticketed for driving alone, and he held up his corporation papers, and he said, if corporations are people, then this is my passenger in the carpool lane. And he <laughs> uh, his birthday was today, so we'll follow up on another story for that. And the third story we did was a review of uh, that uh, kind of uh, a pageant of propaganda that was the Zero Dark Thirty movie. Mm -hmm. So processes that 
you know, my wife is off to work early. I get up in the morning. I get my kids on the, the school bus. Uh, I walk my dog. I walk down to my office at 8, from between 8 and 11. Uh, I write. Uh, I try to get them done. It took me a little longer today. So by then I took some lunch. And then by 1, I was shooting uh, the video in my little studio. And then by 2, I'm back here editing and rendering and putting together what is a 12-minute video, which was uploading just when we started this, so it's probably uploaded now. Mm -hmm. And then I actually have a, I, I just, it, I just have a partner, uh, a woman, AJ Russo, who was my uh, assistant uh, editor and assist associate uh, producer on American Autumn, who lives in upstate New York. I sent her the usended file, and she'll take those three, the the, the big 12-minute video, and she'll cut them into three short stories. And every two hours, starting at like nine or ten o'clock, those other videos will get uploaded um and the name of that game is 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 that you know you you need to get the you need to get this con you need to get this content out or we need to get a lot of content out if we're going to have this be sustainable and something that's going to pay our bills right so the now instead of these shorter bits is putting together a t 10 to 12 minute daily piece of content uh that will then i have an assistant who's going to break up that content and get it out into the world right Okay, and so in your current uh, organization right now, it's you and one other person that are doing all this creation, production, and posting. Yeah, AJ is part-time. I can't afford to pay her full-time, but I mean the work that I'm asking her to do is basically to take one video and splice right. it into and upload it for me. So yeah, it's what, right. I, it's, it's one person. It's impressive. <laughs> and that lights and... Um, you know, there's a little app you can get for your phone or for your iPod that serves as a teleprompter. Uh, and, um, uh, yeah, so I'm the camera person, the lighting designer, the sound guy, the editor, and uh, the writer. Yeah, it's so it's so clean and well done and effective. It's just bang, 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 there it is. It's not, you know, it's you just draw us in. And it's a, it's a great method that you have, and, you know, we really, really enjoy it. Um, I have a question from the chat. What can we do to make these new media visions viable and sustainable for the long term? And this comes back to, I guess, the revenue and the business models. But mm -hmm. say for somebody like OPN, you know, we're small potatoes. We're not doing anything for ads. We have to run free channels. You know, what advice do you have for, you know, us and live streamers are much in the same boat um, as a media professional? For sustainability, well, yeah. yeah. So, so sustainability, I, I take to mean you know money or, or some kind of you know yeah I guess you have to define you know what you what, what you mental need. emotional and economic sustainability because there's mean, three separate things. Right. So at some level you have to be doing work that you yourself are proud of, right? And like so you can't be chasing. You know, I'm sure that I could do video commentary on, you know, Katy Perry or, or whatever, and we could make we could make some money. Like th these videos will find their algorithm on Google and YouTube, and they'll be seen more often, and the ads will get clicked more often, and we'll all make more money. So the, the first step is you have to do some work that you yourself want to do, and you feel like you're doing some good work that at least you're proud of. Uh, but then as far as sustain sustainability is a, is a tough one because you have to define that for yourself. Do you need to make X dollars a month? Well, you know, how, how are you going to get that? Are you going to sell? Are you going to solicit donations on the Internet? You know, get in line. So is everybody else, right, you know, right. difficult, you know, and mainly if you're doing the types of content that we're talking about um, that's existing outside of this narrow left right paradigm, which you which kind of swoops up most of the population, your audience probably doesn't have any money. So even if they really wanted to help you, they probably can't. Mm -hmm. uh, they would help you in other ways by um, aggressively sharing your video or, or uh, blogs or podcasts or live streams on Twitter and Facebook and things like that. So I think so for sustainability, the first thing is find a community and that'll sustain you you know, that'll sustain you emotionally, that'll sustain you spiritually, that'll sustain you creatively. Uh, and then again, you know, the money thing for me is like marketing. I've been a little bit lucky since, you know, I'm 43 and I, I quit a, a very good, a very well-paying uh, teaching job uh, five or six years ago. And I've been lucky in that I haven't fallen too far behind. I mean, I have a ton of graduate student debt that I keep deferring. 
I have some credit card debt, but for the most part, I'm very lucky, Mark. You know, my kids, you know, if they want to take a karate class or a music lesson, you know, I, I somehow have the money to, to pay for it. Uh, so, but I, I'm very lucky. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't, <laughs> I don't think I have a magic bullet to answer the, the money part of the sustainability question. Right. You, you, you know, you speak to something that resonates with me because I, I mentor a lot of artists and I teach a lot of post-grad um, artists, uh, do seminars and things like that. And that's always the question, how am I going to make money at my art? And I, I say, you know, really, I think you have to get over making money with your art. You have to do it because you love it and because it needs to be done and just figure it out. And you're, you know, you're a good example of that. I might, I might play this interview for some of the seminar classes I do. <laughs> um, well, following that, what advice do you have in summary for media producers, whether they're bloggers, live streamers, uh, people like us that do interviews, uh, writers? Uh, what, what's your, your words of wisdom and advice you can leave us all with to ponder? I have a lot. I have some words of wisdom, but I don't want anyone to think that I have followed this. So this <laughs> is myself, right? Right. Uh, me, we talk about the artists, and you know, I, you know, I, I, my creative, my background is creative. I, I do believe in the power of limits, creatively speaking. Mm -hmm. For for me, what I'm trying to do is to block out all the other ideas that try that hit me in the mo head in, in the head every morning that are impulses to start other things and just stick with the template that I've created for myself and commit to it for a year. You know, I might not see the video views go up for a little while. I might not see the revenue come in for a while, but I know I look at this stuff at the end of the day. Uh, that this one might be better than that one. This might be better. But this template for me works. So find a template for you that works, that will keep you sane, that is not don't try to do too much work. Stop working at some point and go home and go for a run or go play, you know, bocce or whatever. Work a, a you know, work hour, you know, eight, ten hours a day, six hours a day, whatever you want to work, and then stop. But find a template that you can do in that, and then repeat that every day for a while. There's very few people that you look at, uh, you know, as far as like famous actors or even people who have a lot of viral videos. They come out of nowhere. That's usually the product of a lot of work, maybe some luck, maybe they knew the right person, they had the right connections. All those things factor into it. But for me, and again, this is advice that I'm trying to follow myself, and I'm not very good at it, but I, I, have, I have had success with just finding a template and repeating that template. For, so for me, that's waking up every day and by 8 o'clock starting to write three stories a day, get three, three videos out a day, do a couple of interviews and post them over the weekend and have some fun with that. I think that's great advice. I mean, I've been trying to do that myself for the very reason, because I wake up and I have 50 ideas and you can't, you, all you do is end up doing all of them badly, you know, so it's just like narrowing that range and focusing. So um, we have any other questions from the chat? And um, if not, Dennis is, is pretty busy and we're not going to keep him on for our long rambling conversations tonight. He, I can hear his phone going off too. Um, I was, I'm waiting to see if any other questions come through the chat, but I, I really want to thank you so much for taking the time out of a, a busy day to speak with us. I, I have an enormous amount of respect for you. A lot of the crew that I work with out of DC and everything are tuned in tonight. This was a eagerly anticipated interview. Um, we're getting a couple of questions. One, are you doing any work that revolves around Hurricane Sandy? Uh, I'm not. I mean, I'm in touch with a lot of the people who work at, uh, uh, with Occupy Sandy, but I, uh, although I'm a New Yorker by birth and disposition, I live in Groton, Massachusetts, which is about halfway between, you know, uh, in Massachusetts or Lowell, Massachusetts and Boston. So uh, I would have to leave my family if I was going to be engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with, with Occupy Sandy. And I, I have, to clarify for some people, I do think of myself as an activist slash writer slash entertainer, but like I said before, I don't know that I can always do all those things all the time. So I, I think that where I've settled now 
is that I want to be a media producer who shines uh, light on, on on some of these other things. So, mm-hmm. you know, on interviews with on Acronym TV with, with uh, surrounding people with, uh, working on Occupy Sandy and uh, with the Rolling Jubilee, which I think uh, are two of the most exciting things to come out of the whole Occupy movement in, in this in this exciting this whole time. I, I gave holiday gifts of uh, gifts in the name of to the Rolling Jubilee to uh, extended family members and things like that. So, but no, as as far as an activist and an organizer. Uh, that's not actually my focus right now. My focus is on creating media that shines a light on some of the fantastic things that those people are doing. Right. Excellent. Um, I have a message here that Bernadine Zinni calls from California and says, tell Dennis I say hi. Um, She remembers you fondly from Freedom Plaza. Um, So we wanted to get that in because if not, I'll get a phone call from her. Um, Here's an, here's another great question. When so much of the inju- when so many injustices are so entwined, intertwined, do you find it difficult to stay on one topic? And do you have a pet project you would like to do in the future? Uh, I do have. Um, I do. I well, yes, and yes. <laughs> find it difficult to stay on one topic. I did mention earlier that I, I have, you know, I, right now, maybe in a time in my life where I'm taking the right vitamins or something like that, where I feel like I have a lot of ideas uh, that would take me away from doing this one thing, Acronym TV, which is a kind of, I think, a shorter version of trying to cover a lot of the interconnected topics that I don't know if the, your questioner saw American Autumn, but I, I went to great pains to try to paint the Occupy movement as as this web that mm-hmm, can mm-hmm. disparate issues, right? right. So uh, the labor issue or the, the health care rights issue or uh, let's, bit, let's jail the Wall Street bankers or let's uh, get rid of the military industrial complex. To me, I do see these things as all interconnected. I do see this as all one big fight. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I, I, do get dist- I do get distracted, but to me, I am working on that one big thing, mm-hmm. which is for lack of a better phrase, I guess, a nonviolent revolution. Right. And so our final question to wrap that up is, how do you think the revolution's going? Well, you know, we just, I think it's, I think it's going, I think people, I think it's going okay. You know, we're all in a hurry because we live in this age uh, where it's instant gratification and the internet and I can text you and I can phone call and I can send a video across the world and you can see it. You know, but it, and I'm not a I'm not a major student of history, but in any in any major social justice movement, these things take years and years and years and years and years. People, young people now today coming out of college, uh, there's a there's a shift where not only is uh, Marxism and socialism, and communism, and these types of words not a third rail that you can't even talk about anymore, but people are young people, not you and I, Mark. Young people are having view of capitalism right? right this this was a this was a non-negotiable this was this was like a, a it was like breathing air it's like a negative view of air mm-hmm. 50 years ago uh, but people are seeing that you know the world doesn't have to be this way just just as it's obscene for a monarchy to live over serfs in elizabeth in you know the medieval england uh so too is it obscene that lloyd blankfein can come down to washington dc after getting uh, a bailout and lecture all of us that social security and medicare might have to tighten their belt i mean these things are people are people see through the charade right now mm-hmm. so uh, how long will we take to break these chains i you know i don't know uh but yeah for me it's moving i feel like it's moving slow but uh, i think for history i think we're, we're doing fine uh, that, that's a good perspective because I feel the same way, but it's also because I'm getting older and I'm like, how how much longer, you know, do, I was in a conversation today, um, somebody had read Henry Waxman's book and how it takes 30 years to accomplish something in the Senate, and I'm like, I don't have 30 years. I mean, realistically, I don't have 30 years, and so that is a source of impatience. The other thing that I find interesting is, Why is there a distinct separation generationally? And it occurred to me the other day, and and I would be interested in getting your viewpoint on this, that let's say somebody that was born in, say, the middle 80s, you know, that age group, 
compared to those of us who were born earlier in the middle 50s to early 60s. Those of us that are older have seen good times and we've seen the decline that we live in now. Somebody born in 85 has never seen anything but decline. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I mean, like I mentioned running a theater company. I was in my 20s in the 90s and talk about raising money and asking for money. It was like it was the easiest thing in the world. Everyone was rich. You know, if you had, uh, you know, if you had a thousand dollars and a dartboard, you could have thrown it at the Nasdaq stock exchange and doubled your money overnight. I had a dartboard. I didn't have a thousand dollars, but I was running a theater company and you can get that money. So I think, you know, but since the, I mean, then since I think culturally the shift has been going on, certainly in my mind, at least, uh, going back to when Reagan uh, broke the airline, uh, mm -hmm. the war on workers really back was was broken a long time ago. Um, and, you know, the, the labor movement's been lumbering around um, hurt and hobbled ever since. Uh, so, but for the rest, of, but for the rest of those young people, yeah, are you saying that maybe is is your, is your point that they don't know any better? Well, they haven't seen the like this this sort of degree of hopelessness is because they haven't seen anything that was better. It's just been a steady downhill ride. Well, gee. <laughs> I'm a buzzkill, aren't I? No, because I'm trying to kind of trying to think of how how you know to provide encouragement and sustain people for the struggle. You know, that young people should be encouraged because they're living in an, an unbelievably uh, you know, they're living in their their lives are history history book material. Their lives are like where were you when material? Where were you when uh, the Occupy movements first started to uh, gain traction in the world? Where were you when this cultural shift started to happen? when we said that capitalism wasn't inevitable, like when we said that the the wage gap between the rich and the poor, that wasn't inevitable. We didn't necessarily know how we were going to fix it, but people are starting to wake up. So they might not be encouraged because the old model of going to the best college and racking up debt and then getting in line and getting a job and getting a mortgage and getting married and getting rich and collecting the most toys before you die, that game is, that game is over. So they, they haven't defined the parameters what the new game is, Perhaps, uh, but I think that they should be very excited and hopeful because they're living they're living in a historically sh uh, shifting sands of time. It's an exciting time. I love that. Um, I'm going to close now, and I want to get this in because uh, Occupy DC is on the stream with us, and um, the media team there is asking when you might be coming to DC again because they need some help and instruction on how to edit some audio and video for We Act Radio and uh, some of the channels down there. So they're looking for when you might be coming to D.C. again. Outside chance they'll come down there around the inauguration, but like I said right now, Mark, my, my focus has been um, just stick to this template. You know, like uh, D.C. Is, is, a, is either, you know, an expensive plane ride or uh, a 12-hour car ride and then crashing with friends. You know, like yeah, it's yeah. hard Give it the work. So, I I I love my time in D.C. and I, I think just to double back a little bit, I won't take up too much more time. As far as like the story I was trying to tell and and objectivity, mm -hmm. if Occupy D.C. is on the line, then I there was a really fascinating documentary that I could have made that I didn't make about the the differences between Freedom Plaza and McPherson, which mm -hmm. which fascinating these two occupations in Washington DC and how there were some people in both camps who could who viewed uh, the, the the nation's capital having two occupations as a positive thing but truthfully most people in both camps viewed each it as a negative thing and there was some animosity between the two groups and it was a fascinating story I was committed to telling a story that inspired people to get involved with the Occupy movement and I couldn't wrap my head around how you know if a couple hundred people in DC couldn't get along. How that would be inspirational, yeah. but uh, but it's a, it's it is a fascinating story. But I have you know made some ties and, and friendships with uh, you know people in from both McPherson and Freedom Plaza, and I think hopefully by now those designations have have gone into the ether, and it doesn't quite matter. Yeah. Um, okay, so Rob, you know maybe inauguration, but. You know, we're we're working the template, we're working the system, and we're focusing. So, Dennis, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I really appreciate the time. 
the good work, the inspiration you, you give us, and thank you for such a wonderful interview. We really appreciate it, and I want to pass on the gratitude from the viewers on our channel and also the viewers on Global Rev, uh, Occupy World News Now, and um, Ribosome's channel. I forget the name right off the top of my head, but we really appreciate your work and your time and your effort, and uh, please accept my gratitude. Thank you very much, Mark. Great. All right. Have a good evening and have a good week. We'll be looking forward to what's going on on the acronym or the Young Turks channel. Okay. Thank you.